I wanted to uh, welcome you all again. Um, we have the good fortune of having Jelaine Schmidt with us tonight. Um, this is our uh, free speaker series, and uh, she will be talking to us. The title of her presentation is From Lost Cause to Lawsuits, The Declining Political Fortunes of the Virginia Division, Sons of Confederate Veterans. Um, Jelaine is a Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. Um, she teaches classes on uh, Latin American, Caribbean, African diaspora religions. Um, she is also um, a teacher on critical whiteness studies um, and on social movements. Uh, she is a local organizer with the Charlottesville chapter of Black Lives Matter and um, has appeared in uh, numerous news outlets and frequently speaks about uh, white supremacy, policing, affordable, ash ac uh, affordable housing, um, and other activism. Um, her work goes well beyond the classroom, um, and I love the, the term she uses is calling, uh, describes as mobilizing footnotes, um, highlighting facts that are often forgotten and discussed only among specialists in conferences or academic journals. And she feels that the work of a public historian is to educate um, a broad swath of people, um, not just in the classroom. Um, to try to persuasively and strategically amplify important and forgotten aspects of history. Um, she has been very active in the, the local uh, struggle to uh, rid Charlottesville of its Confederate monuments. And uh, during 2017, she was very instrumental in um, helping organize counter demonstrations. Um, and uh, that's a very short biography, but I just wanted to uh, introduce Jelaine Schmidt and thank her very much for joining us tonight. And uh, if you want to share your screen and, and jump into your presentation, uh, right. thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Tom. And also I want to say thank you to Shelly Murphy and uh, Sterling Howell uh, for extending the invitation uh, to me. It's uh, great to um, have uh, different audiences for the work that I'm doing and, and uh, in, in the hope of getting um, some feedback from, uh, from different sectors. And I just wanted to say a little bit about like why I did this uh, research. Um, and it is that, that you know, I, I've been involved here for a number of years uh, here in Charlottesville with, the, uh, uh, with uh, an effort to um, uh, remove Confederate statues. I don't think that's any surprise uh, to anyone here. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to learn more about the people, the organizations uh, that were instrumental in installing these, these statues. Um, oftentimes those of us that want to get rid of these statues are accused of uh, not knowing our history, wanting to erase our history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, obviously, I, you know, I disagree with that, but I do take the charge seriously uh, in, uh, in so much as uh, that, that I, I do want to kind of delve in and, and see, you know, who, who, was, who was behind um, putting in these, these, these monuments? What were their goals? Um, what were uh, uh, some of the tenets of their organization? What other sorts of activities were they involved in? I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, and I, you know, and, and I also found that, you know, in the last four years as, as uh, you know, kind of the debate over statues um, in our city of Charlottesville, Virginia and, and nationwide kind of heated up. I was running into um, a lot of uh, current members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, um, debating them by proxy, as it were, in city council chambers here in Charlottesville or in Richmond in uh, general assembly uh, hearing rooms, uh, you know, kind of a varying results uh, depending, upon the, uh, depending upon the year uh, uh, when legislation was being considered. So that's, you know, that's me. So I just, I just want to, you know, kind of disclose that, you know, I, I've uh, more often than not been interlocutors uh, with members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans because we're coming from very different positions, of course, you know. Um, also, just want to say something about just kind of the, the ca uh, some caveats, as it were, kind of the, the limits of this project. Of course, this is a work in progress. Um, I'm uh, writing a book on Civil War memory in Charlottesville um, and, and a bit more broadly. And so the, what I'm presenting tonight is not meant to be a capacious history of the Sons of Confederate, uh, the Virginia Division Sons of Confederate Veterans uh, or the Charlottesville camp uh, of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Rather, uh, what I'm presenting tonight is a, you know, kind of a, just a uh, synopsis, a kind of a history that's framed within this larger research project that I have about the history of the struggle over Civil War memory. So 
Um, I have uh, still, you know, lots to learn and, um, you know, there, there are, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, members of the audience uh, um, can help to fill in some of my gaps, uh, you know, that, that I have uh, going here with the how to uh, kind of better incorporate uh, other data. I should say something about um, the sources that I'm consulting uh, are, uh, it's kind of funny, you know, about a year ago, we kind of went under on, on lockdown about, I was just reminiscing today that the last public um, gathering that I went to inside with a group of people was last Liberation and Freedom Day, the final day, March the 8th, um, you know, and, and uh, this has had this kind of, this lockdown has had a lot of effect on us, those of us who do research as well, because we can't go into archives, you know, and so we're dependent upon what, what could be uh, digitized, you know, um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, digital resources out there that were um, different university libraries got together and, and, and put up online. So, and one of them was a Confederate veteran, uh, which was a newspaper, a news a magazine, I guess you'd call it, um, that uh, was published between 1893 and 1932. And it was kind of the official organ of the United Confederate Veterans and then the UDC, um, United Daughters of Confederacy and the Sons of Confederate Veterans. So it was kind of like, all were kind of publishing in this in Confederate Veterans uh, together, you know, for, for about four decades there, you know? Um, and so this, you know, I'm using uh, those sources, uh, also uh, the Daily Progress, you know, uh, sources, um, the diary and memoirs of RTW Duke Jr., who was a local judge uh, here, who was the founder. And um, while I'm, let's uh, look at him here. There's uh, RTW Duke. Um, he was the son of, uh, uh, of a Confederate colonel, you know. Um, also the proceedings of the um, Grand Camp of Confederate Veterans of the Department of Virginia uh, of 1924, or excuse me, 1921. Uh, and then also the annual reunion uh, uh, of 1924 of the um, Virginia division of the, of the UCV and um, the Virginia division SCV as well. So these kind of primary sources uh, coming from them. And then, and then I'm kind of jumping ahead to, you know, as I said that this, you know, my my looking at these sources and, and, and learning is kind of you know, framed within this project that I have of looking at Civil War memory and contemporary um, challenges and debates that we have here in Charlottesville, Virginia and beyond. So I'm also looking at contemporary news accounts since about the year 2000, all right? Um, also secondary sources, um, Elizabeth Verones has, you know, has done some uh, recent work on uh, RTW Duke Jr. who we see here um, and um, Adam Dombey. Um, uh, his, his work, uh, um, false, The False Cause, Fraud, Fabrication, and White Supremacy in Confederate Memory, uh, has a lot of, of information about the Sons of Confederate Veterans as an organization, uh, as does the work of Kevin Levine, uh, Searching for Black Confederates, The Civil War's Most Persistent Myth. Both of these books uh, document the Sons of Confederate Veterans, tw mainly 20th century advocacy efforts to prop up uh, the lost cause. And Hey, Tulane. Yeah. Um, we're just having some comments about the presentation screen. Um, are, have you switched a slide or it, it just seems to be in the PowerPoint, not in the presentation screen? Let's see. Um, what are you seeing right now? Sorry. We're seeing your uh, the slides on the left in terms of seeing all of them and then the one, um, yeah. the first one. Oh, sorry. So are you seeing the, the, the seal here? All we're seeing mm. is the first one, the from lost cause to lawsuit. Oh, you're only seeing this one. Let's see. It yeah. says it's paused. Now, why, why is yeah. that? I don't know why we that happened. Not down below that at all. Huh. It says it's paused. Let me stop the share and I'll start it again. Let's see if that, th thanks for alerting me, by the way, folks. Appreciate yeah, I just wanted to make sure before right. you got too far and had Absolutely. to go back through them. Let's see, are you, what are you seeing now? Can I ask? Now's the seal. The seal, okay, wonderful. So we miss seeing RTW Duke, but oh well. Oh well. Oh well, yeah. So uh, here's, you know, here's the seal of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I, I love, you know, seeing what different organizations that use the, the seal of the, of the Commonwealth of Virginia, kind of what they do with the kind of the choices that they make in terms of presentation, in this case, Virtus 
uh, is fully clothed, is not, uh, you know, in, in, in other versions, of course, um, uh, she is unclothed, you know, on, on top. So this is a, a bit more modest uh, presentation kind of in keeping with the um, concern that these gentlemen often express about uh, Southern womanhood and, you know, these, these sorts of things. So that's, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, so the Lost Cause. Um, Lost Cause uh, was, uh, you know, can, can I see kind of a show of hands? Sorry, I go into teacher mode here. I'm always asking my students, you know, can I see a show of hands? You know, when, if I say the phrase Lost Cause, does that mean anything to people? Have you heard of that before? I see hands. I'm like, okay, I'm seeing hands. Okay, great. Yeah. So the, the Lost Cause, it was a title of a book, actually, that came out the year after the war, Civil War concluded, um, titled um, a book by uh, um, Edward Pollard. Uh, who had uh, been to UVA, been at UVA. And the, the argument of the lost cause, it was kind of a, a, the preferred narrative of white uh, uh, Confederate Southerners. We have to remember there were also unionists you know, in, in the South. So we don't want to just say the South um, because there were a lot of people in the South. There were 4 million black people uh, you know, who were um, very glad that the union triumphed. There were also unionists uh, among some of the white population as well. But among Southern white Confederate sympathizers, uh, the lost cause was the preferred narrative. And the lost cause went something like this. Uh, the war, and, and it was the war between the states, not the Civil War, that was the first thing. Um, and it was fought over states' rights, not slavery. And in any case, slavery was not that bad. It was a benevolent uh, relationship between uh, um, masters and, and servants, as they were euphemistically called. Uh, strategically brilliant Confederate generals were bested only by the North's brutal industrial might. So these are, you know, kind of the, the kind of founding tenets, as it were, of, of, of the Lost Cause. So the Sons of Confederate Veterans itself was founded in um, 1896 in Richmond. It's a fraternal organization for men, uh, men who can demonstrate through genealogical research, that is uh, muster rolls, parole records, pensions, convalescent home applications, death certificates, etc. cetera, uh, that men that can demonstrate that they're direct descendants of Confederate veterans. And in keeping with the kind of martial ethos uh, of the organization, the organization's structure features, features uh, military designations. It has divisions and camps um, and its, its uh, officers are commanders and adjutants and so forth, you know? Um, and so the, uh, today, uh, the Sons of Confederate Veterans nationally counts about 30,000 members in 800 camps across the United States. Uh, within Virginia, there are about 70 camps in the Virginia division, which claim about 3,000 members, right? Um, so Charlottesville's local RTW Duke camp of the Sons of Confederate Veterans actually formed three years prior to the national SCV, um, you know, which says something about, you know, kind of just the organizational strength of, uh, of, of the founder here and, 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 his, and his, uh, his associates um, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, kind of um, local sentiment about this. And they held they had about 100 members. Uh, they held regular meetings, oftentimes in the courthouse. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting thing about that this period of time that the courthouse was kind of a almost like a public auditorium, um, you know, in, in, in terms of how, how it was used after hours anyway. So um, and, and this this local RTW Duke camp of the Sons of Confederate Veterans was founded by Judge Duke, who was the son of Colonel Duke, uh, and they were of a, a slaveholding family, of course, you know. Um, so jumping ahead here to a uh, photo, this is the uh, Jackson statue unveiling. So this is the um, downtown beside the courthouse. You can see this Confederate flag and this bunting, you know, over here um, on the side of a, of a courthouse of a kind of auxiliary building for the courthouse here. And then of course, here is uh, uh, General, General Jackson and, and uh, you know, and there's, you know, a large crowd here you can see, you know. Um, and so this is in October, 1921. And importantly, uh, it's, it's the Sons of Confederate Veterans that are hosting the entire Virginia division here. You know, and you can see, you know, this is a big crowd. Um, schools let out for the day. The university classes are canceled. The university president's there, the faculty, students, um, you know, all the school kids, townspeople, businesses are closed for the day. It's a big spectacle, it really is, you know. And, you know, organizationally at the center of it, with, with of course, the, the United Daughters of the Confederacy providing a lot of, of, of infrastructure as well. But the Sons of Confederate Veterans are having their statewide reunion. And it's a way for an organization to kind of boast of its 
uh, of, of its chops, you know, in, in terms of, you know, being able to, you know, kind of command, you know, kind of a large number of guests to come from all over the state, you know, uh, and, and stay for several days, you know, that this was, and, you know, and here they are, you know, so it's, it's a spectacle, you know, um, and, you know, so this, this is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it kind of allows the, the organization, the local uh, SCV camp, you know, to, to kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of stick its chest out a little bit and say, you know, and kind of do, um, you know, uh, you know, take note, you know. Um, so in Virginia, the, uh, the uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans, uh, you know, it's a very large division. The Virginia division is, uh, was the largest, I don't know if it still is, but um, of the divisions um, uh, of the Sons of Confederate Veterans uh, and provided uh, a lot of leadership, you know, um, for, uh, uh, for the organization as a whole, and I'm afraid to say this kind of slipped here, but uh, you can see here. So the the um, there are are kind of you know numerous references to uh, uh, to the Klan, uh, positive references I should say, to the Klan in the Confederate Veteran Magazine. Uh, in, you know, through the first uh, three or four decades, well, yeah, until the 19 well into the 1920s, um, numerous uh, approving references to the Klan in, in their own publications, that is, uh, that are, you know, profiles of founders of the Klan who were veterans, um, romanticizing narratives about the Klan's exploits. Um, the Sons of Confederate Veterans endorsed um, a, uh, a book um, uh, that was written by a, a historian from the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the Ku Klux Klan or Invisible Empire. So I have that around here. I wanted to, oh, here we go. Can, probably can't see it, but anyway, uh, lovely little book here. And uh, the Sons of Confederate Veterans were happy, happy to endorse it. If you can see this here. Um, and uh, th they also reported in Confederate Veterans, they were just gleeful in 1915 when uh, Birth of a Nation came out. That is the blockbuster uh, D.W. Griffiths film, uh, uh, an epic about um, the Civil War reconstruction and, and the Klan kind of played, you know, um, depicted as these kind of glorious uh, knights, you know. Um, and as Adam Dombey has documented, there were several national um, um, Sons of Confederate Veterans commanders who were also Klan leaders as well. And that's the case here in Virginia, uh, where the uh, commander of the Virginia division, uh, W. McDonald Lee, no relation to the general, uh, was was a Klansman, and he was also the became then the commander of the National uh, SCB as well. And here you have a an account here uh, from the Richmond Times Dispatch of a of a, of a quite uh, a clamorous meeting of the National SCB when when um, W. McDonald Lee was reelected uh, to the presidency. You know, um, another locally here, kind of looking at. Uh, Charlottesville and the SCV. Now here is the dedication of the Lee statue. This happened in, in 1924. Um, and, and uh, you know, much, much, uh, uh, um, it was a big controversy when this, this postcard went into kind of circulation about five or so years ago. Again, you know, this is a vintage postcard from the 1920s, but you know, someone kind of found it and said, oh, looky here, this looks like a row of Klansmen here. You know, here they are, my God, you know. Um, they are not Klansmen. Um, the, the, those aren't Klansmen. They're actually um, Virginia Military Institute uh, cadets in their dress whites, and I think those are kind of the plumes, you know, from their um, from their hats. But all that is, but, but which is not to say that Klansmen weren't present. Okay, um, and it's notable that you know uh, that these you know as the Sons of Confederate Veterans are coming in again. This is in 1924. Again, as in as three years before, it's a statewide reunion of the entire Virginia division of, of, of the SCV. So there are men, hundreds and hundreds of men coming in from all over the state over a period of days. And it's, it's in the, if you watch the, you know, read the daily progress, the accounts of this, it's like, oh, another train came today. And, you know, with a delegation from Roanoke and this one, you know, and it's just like, it's just, you know, the town is just a Twitter. I mean, it's a small town, you know, 1920s uh, South and, you know, it was a big deal. And, these guys are coming in. So it's for several days successively, you know, that more and more of these SCV members are coming in, you know, the festivities basically went from May 15th through the 22nd in 1924. Um, and interestingly, this, uh, you know, as there are more people coming into town, this coincided with a sharp uptick in Klan activity 
Um, it's a cross burning, a parade. I mean, it was just extra, you know, it was just extra, you know, um, in, the di in the days prior to the Lee statue dedication uh, ceremony. Now, you know, coincidence is not causality, of course, we can't, whoops, uh, we can't, you know, prove uh, that, that, uh, that there was, uh, uh, that these uh, men that were coming in were uh, uh, some of the ones participating in, in uh, this uh, um, increased clan activity, but it, it does, it does merit uh, a comment because it, it's quite marked, you know, when, when you, when you look at it, just the, the increase there. Um, but at any rate, um, as Elizabeth Verone and Brendan Wolf have recently documented, the, and as I mentioned, you know, the Virginia Division um, SCV commander, W. McDonald Lee, who'd just been elected the national commander, uh, was a Klansman. Uh, and he was, I should say, no relationship to uh, General Lee. So, um, so I think it's, it's, you know, kind of common to kind of regard the, the Sons of Confederate veterans is, you know, they're kind of, you know, harmless history buffs that dedicate themselves to reenactment weekends at Civil War battlefields, tending Confederate graveyards and such. And, you know, and, and probably for a few, it's, you know, as I mentioned, there, you know, it's quite, quite a bit of Klan veneration there, you know, through the 1920s. Um, um, and I, I have, a, I have to, to say, I have a lacuna, kind of a gap in my sources because of what I was able to, to uh, consult and not consult because of the closure of archives during the, during this time, kind of, you know, like I said, the Confederate veteran, you know, kind of kind of ends in 1932, you know, and I'm kind of uh, um, skipping ahead then. Um, but the, you know, kind of the, the thinking about the sons of Confederate veterans is like, well, you know, compared to all those other neo-Confederate groups, you know, the you know the, the League of the South or the Virginia Flaggers or such, you know, these these guys are the grown-ups in the room. You know, they're reenactors. They're teaching history. Um, and this, you know, was until a decade or so ago you know, more, more, I no, don't say completely, but more accurate, you know, um, but what happened about, a, you know, 20 years ago, I'll go into this just a bit, is that the moderate SCV members kind of got drummed out of the organization, um, and, and there's been this steady radicalization of the SCV um, in the past uh, 20 years, much to the dismay of just the kind of regular guys, you know, who want to, you know, have those reenactment weekends and get together with folks and you know, learn about history and this sort of thing, that there's been a kind of a hardening of, of, of the organization. Um, and so, you know, between the 19, in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a struggle in the SCV to kind of get rid of the haters, you know, and a, there, you know, an establishment of a, a no clan policy, you know, you couldn't be a, you know, a hater, a member of, you know, one of these hate organizations. Um, but in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, the hard right, there was a hard right surge in the SCV, uh, national SCV, uh, in their elected office officials. And so what happened then in the early 2000s, late, late 1990s, early 2000s, is there was a more activist issue advocacy uh, orientation among SCV leadership um, as they were on the lookout for perceived slights to quote unquote Southern culture, which to them, of course, is coterminous with the veneration of the Confederacy. Um, and Kevin Levin has, has documented this in, in, his, in his book, Searching for uh, Black Confederates, you know, how particularly the, the television miniseries Roots in the 1980s, and then the, I believe it was the 1990s, the, the film Glory, which was about the uh, 54th Massachusetts uh, US Colored Troops um, Regiment. Those two movies, the, the, the national SCV just went into high gear, you know, trying to uh, uh, combat the, the, basically, the, the, the SCV was no longer in control of the narrative about the Civil War. That's what, they, that's what really concerned them, you know, and all this kind of lost cause nostalgia for the antebellum South was being punctured, you know, by these accounts, by roots, you know, just the horrors of slavery, you know, and, and glory, just, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the honor, you know, of, of uh, Black military servicemen, you know, uh, fighting for their own emancipation, you know, so this, so this is going, you know, late 90s, uh, early 2000s, this, you know, this is really coming to a head within the organization itself, um, just at the time when Virginia is going through its own kind of political convulsions, you know, and if you've lived here for, for a while in Virginia, things have changed quite a bit. I just tweeted out the other day, I said, like, you know, is Virginia now the, uh, are we a mid-Atlantic state now? Or, or are we still upper south? You know, yeah, it depends on who you ask, you know, and, and what day and what, and what part of the state uh, as well. But you know, there's been a lot of change in the past two decades here. So, and, and usually this, this you know, with respect to 
Civil War memory and the kind of organizational strength of the, of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, this often came around proclamations, government proclamations from the governor's office or the state legislature about Confederate Heritage History Month, um, you know, or Lee Jackson Day um, uh, um, commemorations and this sort of thing, you know. Um, so in 1997, you know, when George Allen, who, who was from, from Charlottesville, wasn't I'm, I'm seeing Cynthia Neff here. I'm like, will you vouch for me? Wasn't he from Charlottesville? George Allen, he had a law office here, I think. I think I remember reading this. Yeah. Came the, you know, was the governor and, you know, it made a proclamation of Confederate History Month, you know, and, and importantly, it was drafted by the SCB Virginia Division, you know, uh, and, and in this, uh, you know, this proclamation said that the Confederate History Month, it, it was uh, commemorating a four year struggle for Southern independence and sovereign rights. Okay. This is coming from the governor's office in 1997. Um, and slavery wasn't mentioned. Okay. And then the following year, uh, new governor, uh, Governor John, uh, Jim Gilmore, also Republican, um, also made a proclamation for Confederate H History Month, but, but in this one, he added a, comment, a condemnation of slavery. Um, and this really angered uh, the SCV Virginia, you know, that this is, you know, kind of, this is a, a distraction, you know, um, from what they, you know, feel was the, the main, main event. Um, the, at that time, the Virginia General Assembly um, approved uh, Confederate flag uh, um, license plates, or, the, or there, there, you know, there was a, a struggle, you know, an illegal fight about whether or not there would be uh, Virginia license plates for your cars, you know, with a Confederate flag on them. Legal fight. Uh, but then, in 2001, the Sons of Confederate Veterans notched a victory, you know. But I gotta say, after that, it's kind of been. Down. And there's, been, there's been zigs and zags, but it's kind of been downhill, you know, for the past 20 years for this organization in terms of their political influence here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, so, you know, so after 2001, after that victory of, you know, getting their Confederate flag license plates, uh, Governor Tim Kaine, now Senator Tim Kaine, uh, did not, you know, during his tenure, did not declare Confederate History Month. And this was, you know, really was, you know, cause for a lot of angst for the neo-Confederates. Uh, and then we have, you know, a, so a Democrat, right, is in office. And now, now here comes a Republican, Bob McDonald, you know, in 2010, uh, you know, who is, uh, um, you know, who, who is uh, making proclamations about this, you know, so this is a, you know, there's, there's, a, you know, dur during all this, you know, the, the kind of, you know, some, a governor would make a proclamation and then there would be the NAACP or other, you know, kind of civil rights groups would say, you know, how dare you, and then there would be some backtracking. This happened with Governor George Allen in 2006, you know. And then, and then the backtracking would make the, the Sons of Confederate Veterans upset. And there was just, just a, lot of, a lot of skirmishes here, you know, going on. Um, also with, uh, um, at the uh, Tredegar Iron Works, you know, now where the, uh, where the uh, American Civil War uh, Museum is, uh, you know, a, a new statue of President Lincoln and his son Thad was installed in 2003 with, with the not, you know, nice uh, uh, tableau letters, you know, to bind up a nation's wound. And this really infuriated uh, the Virginia division, the Sons of Confederate Veterans. They said this was a slap in the face. You know, so you can see like uh, where it comes to Civil War memory, um, you know, what used to be kind of unquestioned, just, just so, you know, um, uh, um, the, you know, kind of accepted conventional you know, Civil War memory and, and, and you know, and, and a lot of the kind of ideological uh, um, um, propping up that went around that was just unquestioned. And so the SCV, you know, it's when this starts to be challenged, you know, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, this is when you see, um, you know, the, the SCV nationally in Virginia here, you know, really get uh, charged up and, and you see it in the leadership battles, who's getting elected to be the commander, you know, at the state level and at the national level, you know. Um, oh, so I should... Let's see what should we do here. So here's a here's an example here. Um, so this this um, you see here is uh, you know about license plates issuing you know honoring Robert E. Lee. You know um, this is on, might have been on the, around the 200th anniversary of his birth or something. You know um, and and what's interesting is you look at this and it's basically unanimous. Like you know. I mean, I, I see, interestingly, I see uh, McClellan and Spruill, who are two um, 
members of the Black Legislative Caucus, they took a took a walk. That's what they call it when you don't want to, you know, vote one way or another. Um, but it's unanimous, and it was unanimous in the Senate. You know, too. This was not seen as controversial. It, which is say this was not a litmus test at this point. You know, just just thirteen ish years ago, not a not not a big deal. Not worth, you know, not worth fighting over, or maybe, maybe you'll take a walk if you don't want to deal with it, but, you know, basically not, not considered controversial, you know. Um, and so this, this, you know, you know, 2007, um, I should look here. There's a license, license tag here. This, this was the, you know, part of what the, uh, you know, the fight was about, so, you know. So this, you know, this, uh, you know, but as I said, you know, things really kind of start getting more contentious, you know, when you get into the, um, by the time you get to, you know, 2010 or thereabouts. And so what's happening is that there is the, with the 200th, or the, sorry, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, um, you know, that um, starts in, in 2011, the 150th observances, you know, that go on for four years. So there's just lots of opportunities for the SCV to be out in front, you know, kind of leading these observances, doing reenactment weekends, teaching, you know, the, and, and this sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it was also, you know, just kind of a vexing flashpoint uh, as well. And there, you know, a lot of uh, 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 incidents, uh, what we see here is when these, these uh, the, the SCV starts getting kicked, Virginia division starts getting kicked out of different venues, places that were just usually just before unquestionably hospitable, their spaces, you know, they are now not able to be there. Like, you know, just example after example. Um, the, you know, in, in 2011, again, 150th anniversary of the war, um, the city of Lexington um, uh, tells them, SCV, no, you can't put your Confederate flags on city owned light poles, you know, and there's a big court battle. I mean, th th so th this, you know, what we're seeing more and more in the last, decade or so is the SCV Virginia division is just filing lots of lawsuits, you know, uh, what's, you know, so there's, you know, big, you know, with, with, with the city of Lexington, you know, they're going to court, you know, um, then, you know, and then, you know, then the next year in Richmond, uh, again, 150th anniversary of the civil war, another, another event there, um, the, you know, members, the SCV members gathered at the Lee monument and they're chanting, uh, uh, what do we want? Kill Yankees. How many? All of them, you know, so this is kind of, you know, very provocative, you know, and, um, but in doing so, they basically disinvited themselves. They were supposed to go afterwards to St. Paul's Episcopal Church there in Richmond, which is sometimes referred to as the Cathedral of the Confederacy, um, because uh, Lee, Jackson, and Davis all worship there. Um, St. Paul's Cathedral said, nope, you can't come here for your event. They can't come to the Cathedral of the Confederacy in Richmond, the former capital of the Confederacy, during the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, they're, they're just being disinvited everywhere, you know. Um, and so, the SCV's planned discussion panel there was canceled. You know, wasn't happening. Uh, you know, uh, the month after that, uh, <laughs> there was a big uh, brouhaha uh, down in Appomattox. Uh, you know, which was of course the site of the of the uh, surrender. Uh, of uh, Lee to Grant um, was the kind of a reopening of the Museum of the Confederacy at the Appomattox uh, uh, branch, then what was then called the Museum of the Confederacy. Um, and, you know, and then there was, you know, an exhibit uh, with, you know, kind of different um, presentations of the, of the, you know, Confederate um, iconography, um, including uh, this panel, which I think is, is lovely, uh, myself, uh, the, you know, um, RuPaul, uh, you know, rocking a fabulous uh, uh, Confederate flag, battle flag sheath dress here. Uh, but it really angered, uh, um, you know, Confederates and, and the, the Sons of Confederate Veterans of Virginia just blasted it. Um, and then um, outside, um, instead of entering the museum, you know, they, they were so upset about, you know, that RuPaul exhibit and just other things that they considered unacceptable because by this point, Mainstream Civil War historiography has just marched right along, and and um, uh, the Sons of Confederate Veterans and other Neo Confederates are not happy about it, you know. Um, and so here, you know, th this is in the sky outside the Appomattox, outside the museum of of, of uh, um, Museum of the Confederacy, 
um, on, you know, on that day there in um, um, 2012. And you can see it says, uh, you know, it's a, it's a plane, you know, airplane that's carrying, you know, a banner behind it. It says reunification by bayonet. Sons of Confederate Veterans, 1896, which of course was the year that the organization was founded. So the, the exhibit uh, uh, at the museum, you know, had something about reunion and reunification and that sort of thing. And the museum had made a decision to not uh, have a Confederate battle flag outside the museum anymore. That's kind of a thing of the past and that really, you know, angered them too. So it's just, you know, it's just kind of one thing after another, year after year, particularly here in Virginia, um, I'm speaking, you know, where the, the Sons of Confederate Veterans is just, is just kind of out of sorts, kind of on the outside, no longer welcome, you know, kind of out, at, out of step, uh, trying to sue entities that used to be their hosts, you know. Um, of course, you know, and, and again, you know, the, the license plate thing comes up again in 2015, right after the Charleston massacre in, in, at Mother Emanuel in Charleston, South Carolina. The Supreme Court decision uh, came back, just happened to come back the, the day after the massacre, uh, and, and, and that decided that states may um, move to ban Confederate flag license plates. This has been an you know, ongoing battle, you know. And Governor McAuliffe, Terry McAuliffe, ordered the Attorney General and the Secretary of Transportation to end Confederate flag license plates. As you might guess, uh, the Sons, you know, were very upset about this, uh, you know, vowed to, you know, to do something. Uh, you know, the year following, 2016, Washington and Lee University, where, you know, Lee is, of course, you know, buried as, as well as Traveler is you know, buried there, um, also banished the Sons of Confederate Veterans of Virginia uh, due to, in, in the words of a Washington and Lee spokesman, the SCV's persistent name-calling vilification and uncivil attacks, that is. Uh, the SCV was very upset about Washington and Lee's, the decisions that were being made about at Washington and Lee about um, not having the Confederate battle flag upstairs in the chapel and have, you know, and moving that down to the, to the crypt, you know, where, where Lee is buried and, you know, these sorts of things were uh, angering them. Um, and so the SCV was not able to hold their annual observance, you know, on Lee Jackson Day at Washington and Lee University. They were kicked out, you know. Um, again, the following year in Lexington, and Lexington, for, for those who don't know, is the burial place of both Generals Jackson and Lee. So it's kind of this Confederate uh, pilgrimage site, you might say, you know, there. So, uh, so in, in 2017 in Lexington, January, uh, you know, we, we, there used to be this, this uh, Lee Jackson day, you know, uh, but a local community anti-racism education group called CARE, which is led by a black minister, they well, just uh, registered for a parade permit and they secured a permit for a Martin Luther King parade uh, that coincided with Lee Jackson Day, you know, um, and the Sons of Confederate Veterans of, of Virginia just publicly denounced um, care effort as in th that you're being disruptive and hateful and, you know, et cetera. So, you know, there, there's just, uh, you know, there's, you know, kind of a steady, steady, uh, you know, decline. I mean, there is zigging and zagging, you know, with different, you know, depending on which party is in control, uh, you know, of, of, of the governorship, but even that is not necessarily a you know, a guarantee that just because a, a, a you know a Democrat is in the highest office that you know that this will um, be be hostile or that a Republican will just you know in a kind of wholesale endorsement you know of loss cost stuff. So, um, but this is you know, but there's certainly this sense that the Virginia Division uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans is fighting a rearguard action. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, with the, all these lawsuits being filed against different municipalities, um, including uh, of course. Um, the city of Charlottesville, uh, when the city of Charlottesville uh, city council, you know, voted to, uh, you know, get rid of a, a Confederate uh, statue of, of General Lee, the Sons of Confederate um, Veterans uh, Virginia Division, you know, filed filed a lawsuit, you know, um, and uh, which is still wrapped up in court. We're still waiting to hear from the Virginia Supreme Court um, about, you know, how that's how that's going to go, you know. Um, so, and then of course, you know, what what happened in in Charlottesville, you know, uh, over uh, over the summer of uh, 2017, was a, you know a series of white supremacist uh, rallies and attacks uh, here in our community, um, and kind of the, maybe the nadir of uh, uh, the Virginia Division SCV's bad publicity came after the after the after the Unite the Right rally um, when there were a, a number, even though the the, the 
Virginia Division, uh, you know, chapter, they had, you know, made it clear that they did not approve of this, were not, did not plan to be there, but a number of their affiliates, members in good standing were there, were, you know, there, we have photos of them, we know their names, we know who they are, um, and they were here, you know, in our streets, so it was kind of, you know, hard to make, it was just, it was really stuck in the craw of Charlottesville residents, the, the fact that the uh, group, that is the Sons of Confederate Veterans of any division that is suing the city through civil action in the courts, some of its members are in the streets enacting violence in uncivil ways, you know, so there's been kind of this, this range, you know, so, um, you know, a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, of, you know, folks were, you know, kind of upset and, you know, it's like, let's, let's not give this organization the benefit of the doubt when you've got, you know, because they haven't been kicked out. These, those that were, you know, um, attended the Unite the Right rally who are members, are still members in good standing of the SCV Virginia division, you know, haven't been, been rooted out at all, you know. Um, so I don't, I want to kind of, I don't want to talk uh, too much longer. I should say, you know, there is, you know, a, a nearby chapter here, you know, the members of, of which, uh, you know, this SCV chapter were patrolling uh, the streets of Charlottesville in the past summer, um, armed, uh, you know, in, in order to, in, in their words, protect the statues, you know, um, um, from vandalism and ended up, you know, kind of accosting passersby in downtown Charlottesville and this sort of thing. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's been some tension, you know, what, what used to be a, you know, kind of a relationship between the city of Charlottesville, you know, kind of rolling out the red carpet for the Sons of Confederate Veterans or, you know, the Sons of Confederate Veterans, you know, kind of inviting in, you know, people from all corners of the state, you know, to see Charlottesville, what used to be this Kind of little partnership, you know, between the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the city of Charlottesville is now, you know, definitely at loggerheads, you know, as, and we're still waiting to see what's the outcome of this of this uh, uh, court case. Um, for its part, that you know, the Virginia Division, it's it's trying to kind of uh, uh, burnish its its image a little bit, you know, um, and, and it, it it sounds crazy to say that, I mean, especially if you go back and look at the early 20th century and all the, you know, the the calls for, and by, by these words, you know, the, the white, the supremacy of the white race must be protected, you know, white supremacy, they weren't embarrassed to use those terms. That's, that's, that's what they said, you know, and it's in their own, in their own publications. Uh, also, as, you know, as I mentioned, the, you know, uh, um, you know, very cozy uh, laudatory accounts of the Klan and this sort of thing. So it's kind of, you know, when you, when you see now the sorts of face that they're trying to put forward now, I'm just going to read just a brief proclamation uh, for Confederate History Month. It's in April. Uh, that, um, let's see, uh, these Virginia men answered the call to arms, uh, rallying. Uh, they came from all backgrounds, free and bonded, rich and poor, educated in the little schooling, old and young, single and married. Virginians of all races and creeds, white, black, Jewish, Latin, Native American men stood side by side as one. The call of virtus was answered by all Virginians, men and women, to do their part of defending her from an invading army, you know. Um, so now it's this kind of this multicultural, uh, you know, uh, appeal, you know, going on. You're very, very. This is something that uh, I, I can tell you. You know, their their great grandparents, you know, in, in, in would not have uh, recognized uh, this this appeal. You know, um, here's I'm going to end with this with this image here, so that we can can talk a, a bit here. Uh, I, I like to call this uh, image. Uh, uh, reconstruction revisited. Um, the uh, gentleman who is this. This is in the um, February 2020, exactly one year ago. Right now, uh, the Democrats had just taken over both houses of the Virginia uh, General Assembly. Of course, the Democratic uh, uh, governor as well. Um, and this is a hearing in the Virginia House of Delegates County Cities and Towns Committee. You know, and here uh, with his back to us facing the committee is, um, um, is the, the Virginia Division SCV um, Heritage Coordinator, the Heritage Defense Coordinator is his title, uh, Frank Ernest. And he is speaking against a bill which has been put forward by, um, by Dolores McQuinn, this, this woman here in, in the middle, um, and uh, which would uh, allow Virginia um, municipalities to remove Confederate statues. This was illegal for over a century, you know. Um, and so, yeah, here's Dolores McQuinn is here, and here is Rita uh, Rita Davis, uh, who's uh, uh, an attorney, the counselor to the governor. Um, and there, you can see, you know, th th this guy's, you know, giving, uh, you know, Frank Ernest is, you know, of the SCV Virginia is, you know, talking, you know, saying, please, you know, don't don't let them take down our statues, you know. 
um, while these black women here uh, who have authored the bill and are shepherding it through are just, you know, going right along, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, considering what they're going to do. And then, of course, the, the, uh, the legislation uh, ultimately passed, of course, and then was signed into law uh, by the governor. But I, I just love this picture. It just, it just encapsulates, you know, uh, where things are at, you know, um, for this organization and where things are at, you know, in, in the state here. Um, so 2020 was a bad year uh, for the SCB Virginia division. Um, the uh, Lee Jackson Day uh, was officially ended uh, as, as a state holiday. Uh, the, of course, the, the, the bill, uh, you know, became law, which, which allows Virginia municipalities to remove Confederate statues, you know. Um, the, uh, there was a, a shifting of funding away from uh, supporting the upkeep of Confederate cemeteries and instead uh, the governor wanted to, you know, give these funds toward the preservation of much neglected uh, African American uh, uh, cemeteries. And I should say, you know, during during all these hearings and stuff, like I said, I ran into these guys a lot, you know, because I was going to Richmond a lot and lobbying, or I run into them, you know, at city city council and the chambers, you know, whenever there's an issue like this, you know, um, you know, and and as this is being debated, you know, I was I took this I took this picture that you're looking at here. I was sitting right behind this guy, you know, I was sitting right next to the podium. I probably went up next, you know. Um, but it, it's telling that uh, how thrown back on their heels the Virginia division is because as this bill was being considered last year about the, the statues bill about you know whether or not cities can take down their statues, uh, the SCV Virginia you know was sending out these missives you know to their members you know um, and warning you know they warning um, please attend these these hearings the opposition the SCV Virginia Division warned is highly motivated and will turn out in droves. And I can attest that we were and we did. Um, and uh, uh, the, the SCV Virginia reported that only, only two SCV Virginia representatives had attended the last hearing. And the exasperated SCV writer complained, this is simply not going to cut it, you know, um, and gave further advice uh, uh, to, to the constituencies, bluntly instructing them do not mention the SCV in your correspondence with members of the General Assembly. Now, that is incredible, you know? Um, and also th this committee that we're looking at right, right here, uh, there was a Republican on this committee, Committee for County, Cities and Towns, who was himself a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans Virginia Division, um, but he kept that under wraps. He didn't, didn't tell anybody, you know? I mean, so we've traveled a long way. I mean, this, this, you know, these uh, neo-Confederate organizations have, you know, really, it's been, you know, quite a, a downturn in terms of their, their power and influence um, in the Commonwealth uh, of Virginia, particularly in the last couple of decades, you know. No, you know, historians, we, we can't make predictions, uh, you know, but um, uh, this is not to say it will always be this way, but, you know, but there's, you know, the, 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 the pattern, the kind of the data points, you know, are, are definitely has been, you know, kind of in, in decline, you know, we have to say. So um, I'll just, I'll just um, stop there and kind of like open it up so we can have conversation. Well, thank you, Jelaine. Um, Let's <clears throat> see, um, let's see, I saw a comment by Ms. Welch in response to your George Allen saying he was originally from California, mm -hmm. um, but like to say he was a Virginian. Right. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the Gastons indicated that uh, the office that uh, George had was even visible in the postcard that you were showing at the time. Oh my goodness. Wow. How about that. Yeah, there were accounts, newspaper accounts about him. He had a noose that he had as a decoration that was hung in there. Anyway, there was a lot of stuff that got dredged up after um, some bad publicity there. But yeah, yeah, but he was he was a big supporter of, you know, and, and it's interesting, these transplants like that, you know, he's from California. We had that also saw that with Corey Stewart, you know, who'd been a gubernatorial and then a Senate, you know, candidate, you know, originally from Minnesota, but it just kind of really uh, kind of dug in, you know, to these, you know, kind of more, you um, uh, reactionary, more reactionary symbols of his new home state of Virginia, you know, as a way of kind of bolstering his home state bona fides, you know, so. Just looking through some of the comments, there's a, 
There's definitely, as you in indicated, a, a skirmish um, in cultural and societal uh, ways, and it's kind of a skirmish going on on our Facebook comments. Uh -huh. um, kind of looking through it a little bit, um, but it might be just something of interest to uh, to look at maybe after our uh, our chat okay. here and. Uh, Do you have any questions, Sterling, that you see on your end? I'm making sure that I can see everything here. Uh, yes, actually, we had an interesting question. Um, uh, do you think that the lessening power of the SCV is more related to uh, members dying out, going underground, or becoming more radicalized? <laughs> Could be all of the above. I don't know. Um, you know, it would be nice to, to have like better empirical, like, like hard numbers. And, and I feel like we kind of only have approximate numbers, you know, like, you know, there are, you know, all these chapters that are around, but just for instance, just in our own local chapter here, which used to be the RTW Duke chapter, right. Um, you know, is, is now the, uh, 19th, uh, Virginia infantry, uh, uh, um, camp number, um, 14, 93, you know, um, you know, so what used to be a really robust organization here locally, the RTW Duke camp um, is now, you know, a, a fairly, uh, you know, uh, very small and, and uh, you know, not, not, not very robust uh, uh, group, you know, they used to have, from, from what I could find anyway, kind of, you know, monthly meetings in the public library and now kind of have dwindled to quarterly gatherings at the Elks Lodge, you know, and the 12 titled officers of their bylaws have, contra have themselves contracted by half, from, at least from what I could, you know, below a quorum anyway, you know, even according to their own bylaws. And at least from what I was able to find, I could only find a commander and, a, and an adjutant. But, you know, please correct me. I'd love to, you know, get more information, particularly that, you know, about when there was this switch over from RTW Duke camp to, you know, 19th Virginia Infantry. I'm guessing there was probably a period of inactivity there or something like that. So, but anyway, but the question is about the decline and to what uh, that can be attributed. I, I think, you know, Virginia is changing and, and you know, and, and you read, you know, th their websites, you know, and their Facebook pages of the SCV Virginia division. I mean, there, there's a lot of resentment there, you know, about, you know, so-called carpet baggers and those people in Northern Virginia and scalawags. I mean, they're using those, you know, the, these kind of very old, you know, incendiary uh, uh, terms, you know, to, to, to talk about uh, the changes that they see going on that are, uh, uh, you know, in, in their, and they're very hostile, you know, in, in, in their language about it. So I think, yeah, there's a change in Virginia politics. Um, these legacy kind of um, fraternal organizations, they just don't attract, you know, in, in, the, in the way that they used to, and that, that's true of a lot of other organizations too. Uh, yeah, also the radicalization. I mean, there are people that just, you know, if, if they're into this, they're going to want to kind of be more hardcore. Could be any of these things. I mean, that would really take a kind of more ethnographic, I think, investigation, which is, I, I would love to read that if someone were, I'm probably not the right person to, to do that investigation, but, but it would be interesting to see, you know, who's joining, who isn't, you know, uh, you know, I mean, there's definitely, you can tell, you know, the membership roles, you know, are, are, are going down for sure. And, and I, sh I should say that um, not all divisions are, or state divisions are equal. Like for instance, the North Carolina division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans um, is, seems to be more politically robust. It has, you know, kind of more influence there, um, kind of violated, you know, 501c3 laws and, you know, made donations to, to a, a uh, political candidates and they're being investigated for that now for that and some other uh, financial improprieties but they're but but they are you know kind of more more robust they're not kind of knocked back on their heels like like this Virginia division is uh, similarly you know the the Georgia division uh, seems to have you know kind of more influence there in, in that state than, than here I mean just just looking at things like you know the license plate issue and you know that kind of thing so um, yeah so not all states are the same you know Um, I have another question here. Did the uh, Daughters of the Confederacy coordinate, complement the SCV in a planned or explicit manner? 
um, how did their histories align? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so a lot of these big events, like like these installation ceremonies, these unveiling ceremonies um, for these uh, statues, um, uh, the the I mean, although the the Sons of Confederate Veterans would be hosting these, you know, these delegations, boy, those ladies in the UDC, they were really doing a lot of work. I mean, it's just amazing if you go and you read the minutes, and it's like these were some very busy ladies. You know, they were really organized. You know, the dinner here and hosting there, and you know, there's just a lot going on. You know, so yeah, they definitely work together, and all what you can see it in the correspondence um, and in the proceedings themselves of these ceremonies. They're always thanking the UDC chapter. You know. Uh, you know, for everything. So yeah, they're definitely, you know, working in tandem. And there's also the John Bowie Strange camp of United Confederate Veterans that's going on, you know, here at the same time. So this, you know, for the first, you know, um, decade or so, the 20th century, I mean, of course, the veterans kind of start dying off, you know, kind of after that. But these these three organizations, the John Bowie Strange camp, the Albemarle uh, chapter, uh, Daughters of the Confederacy, and the uh, Duke camp, SCV, very strong, very, the, the social profile of these people, these are some of the highest profile members of the community. They're judges, they're attorneys, they're doctors, they're professors, you know, these are some very high status people, you know, that are involved in these organizations. And yes, UDC is, is you know, very important part of that mix, you know, and, and so that's, that's the difference that I'm seeing is, is just the uh, kind of the social profile of, of, of the membership, you know, seems very different today than it was, you know, in earlier, in earlier decades, you know, when it was, there was kind of much more of a prestige factor to it. And um, I, I, I sense now, at least, you know, just in, in, in what I read, you know, on their own websites and, and newsletters and this sort of thing, there, there's kind of, there's a kind of a grievance. And, and I guess, I mean, well, the lost cause is all about grievance. I mean, so that shouldn't be surprising, you know, but, um, but, but there's a, there's an edge to it now, I would say uh, uh, that the, the decorum Piece. I mean, like, 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 you know, look at this. You know, I mean, that's that's a uh, that would have been beneath the dignity. You know, I think of, of prior generations of, of of members, but and they wouldn't have had. I mean, I guess this is you know is also kind of testament to the sorts of uh, 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 lengths they felt they had to go to to make their their protest known. They're they're just they're outside the. They're not around the table. They're not at the table making these decisions anymore and they sense it. And so this is, this is what they're, the kind of thing they're, they're resorting to and they're not getting their way the way they used to and not having the same kind of influence. You see any more questions coming through Sterling? I see lots of comments, not much of what I would call questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a number of uh, folks that are very um, happy um, about the research you've done. Uh, there are a number that express a certain... Um... Well, I do, in terms of looking at social discourse in regards to mm -hmm. these issues, um, in many ways, some of what I see here is saying that there needs to be a counterpoint um, to what you are saying. But at the same time, would that counterpoint be utilizing the same resources that you do or the source material, or would they be looking at it from a different vantage point? I'm just, I guess, mm -hmm. in terms of what your opinion on that would be. Yeah, well, I, I would say that, I mean, I'm providing a counterpoint because we've got a hundred years of, of this, you yes. know, and this, that's, that's what we've had for a hundred years, you know, and so I'm mm -hmm. kind of, I'm puncturing that a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, um, so uh, I would say I'm giving the counterpoint, you know, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, yeah, not, you know, as I said, you know, when I pointed out, you know, even here, you know, as recently as, you know, not, this is not that long ago. This was not seen as controversial. This is the, the Robert E. Lee license plate. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, I, I was... forgot to mention, I forgot to mention uh, that this same year, the SCV pressured the General Assembly to table a suggestion. They were just going to have a, 
you know, just a, it was the 200th anniversary of the birth of Abraham Lincoln. So they were, you know, somebody wanted to have, oh, let's make a proclamation, but the, the SCB Virginia quashed that. That was the same year as this Robert E. Lee license plate. You know what I mean? So, so there's a, you know, there was a, a you know, kind of there, there was a narrative there that had really taken hold, you know, uh, uh, for, you know, for more than a century, you know, and, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm giving that some pushback and yeah, that's, that's going to meet resistance and it, it, it is kind of puncturing the kind of, you know, the assumption or the, or the kind of conventional narrative that has uh, held sway, you know, for a long time. So I can see, and as I mentioned, this is not what I presented here. This is not meant to be a capacious treatment of this group. Mm -hmm. um, th this is, this is uh, within a, a, another project that I'm doing, which is kind of looking at, at bottles over Civil War memory here locally and in the state of Virginia nationally, you know. So this is not the be all and end all treatment of, you know, of, of this group. You know, it's, it's, it's looking at, the, but I am looking at their own sources, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's curious to see the, you know, the changes over time, you know, and how they're, how they're bolstering their position, their lost cause positions, you know, in, in very different ways in, in different centuries, you know, like, you know, Yeah, there's a comment on uh, Facebook. Um, the, the wounds of the Civil War still play out now. Yeah, um, absolutely. Maybe we can at least agree about that. Oh, um, absolutely. And un yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, the, the the wounds of that war in terms of Reconstruction and the period after, and mm -hmm. and and how that all played out in our country, and and and, and what we saw just this past summer, um, in so much, you know, bringing that to the forefront. I, I yeah I completely agree. It's like we're we're still healing, um, and it's a matter of yeah. the pendulum has to swing to one side and then the other, and hopefully we can find a middle ground. Yeah. Well, and, and I and I I should should have said that like for instance at the Lee statue um, unveiling you know here um, well and this is true at, at a lot of these statue unveilings there were just you know speeches just harangues against Reconstruction. You know, and just how horrible it was, and just you know, now now we're getting back to the way things are supposed to be. You know, I mean, so they're, they're really hanging a lot on these public symbols that they're having installed in places, and the sorts of messages that they are 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 sending. But you know, but that that's telling to me that you know, when we the first instance we have of kind of a multiracial democracy for kind of you know a brief you know dozen years or whatever it was that this a hundred and some years later you know or fifty or some years later. Is is the object of of uh, um, is just it being excoriated, you know, while, while you're putting up a statue of, of Robert E. Lee, you know, and 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 you know these harangues against Reconstruction. What's that about, you know? Well, thank you very much, Jelaine. Um, I think looking at what we have here, there's um, definitely a lot of comments and uh, yeah. we will have these preserved as a document to, for a conversation to come and uh, I think I'll see if I can stop sharing the screen. Oh, okay, Oops. here, sorry, I can, I can do it. There we go. How's that? There we go. All right. Looks great. Um, so if anyone wants to wave goodbye or, or anything of that nature, um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, please uh, consider supporting uh, your local historical society to uh, bring you these free presentations. Uh, we are uh, doing the best we can in an online world and, and how we're trying to reach out and uh, touch people and, and, and tell a a whole history. And, uh, and I wanted to just kind of repeat, you know, what our mission is and, and because it, it felt very important in terms of telling that to somebody earlier today in response to another question about this. And the Historical Society's mission is history is not the past, it is the story we tell about the past. Every person in Albemarle County in the city of Charlottesville has a unique and a powerful story to tell. Mm -hmm. And through collecting, preserving, and interpreting this history of our community, we are committed to informing, inspiring, and bringing together all people, creating opportunities for new relationships and new understandings. Um, so I, I thank you very much for uh, elucidating a, uh, um, a history here of something that I know uh, 
as you definitely say, uh, you're, you're piercing something and you get pushed back and, and that's, uh, that's a good thing because it starts a conversation. I hope that will lead us, um, to, to a better, uh, understanding of an honest understanding of, uh, what our past was that, uh, that can uh, help us to understand maybe, maybe a little bit more about where we are now and where we need to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. So, uh, so unless you have anything else, Sterling. Um, yes, yeah, lots of thank yous. Job. Thank yous. Great jobs. Well, um, thank you all again for joining us. Thank you very much again, Jelaine. Thank and um, hope everyone stays safe and warm through whatever our weather may bring. And uh, we will see you next time, next week on the 24th. Um, it's a noon um, showing, I believe. Um, we will have uh, the Gaston children, um, Blaze, Gareth, and Chinta, who will be discussing um, their father, Paul Gaston's uh, legacy. Uh, we recently, uh, uh, in our uh, recent magazine that came out, had a transcription and a annotated transcription of his interview um, that was done with him in 1988. And uh, the children will talk a little bit more about uh, their memories of their father and uh, the role they he played in their, their lives as much as the local community's lives. So hope you can join us then. And uh, until then, stay safe. And thanks again, Jelaine. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you.